and can people also see my screen? Yes. Yes. Amazing. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to develop and how to phrase your research question. You know, when you when you watch shows like University Challenge or Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you get the impression that asking questions is really easy and answering questions is really hard. But in reality, it's often the other way around. Uh, asking a really good question can be very hard and especially asking an answerable question that's relatively easy to answer because the research we're doing is essentially ask, answering that question. So I'm going to ask you a simple question. Which planet is closest to Earth? What would you say? Feel free to unmute yourself and just give me an answer. Which planet is closest to Earth? Jupiter. Jupiter? Anyone else? Venus? Venus? Anyone else? Mars. Mars? OK, we've got a few candidates now. And you might be disappointed when I tell you that this is what I've asked you is actually a really bad question because it's, it's very, very unclear. What did I actually ask you? So you, you may have been thinking of a model of the solar system like this, where you think, oh, Earth, Earth is sandwiched between Venus and Mars, and yeah, Jupiter is also nearby in Mercury. But what did I actually ask you? Did I ask you which planet has the shortest average distance to Earth? Or did I ask you which planet is the closest for the longest time throughout the course of the year? Or did I ask you which planet ever gets the closest? Or did I ask you which planet takes the least amount of time to travel to? And these are just a few examples. I could have, I could also have asked which planet is the closest right now on the 29th of April. And the reason why this really matters is because you may or may not be surprised to hear that the answer to the first two questions is Mercury. The answer to the third question is Venus. And the answer to the fourth question is probably Mars. We don't know yet because we haven't been there yet. So my point is that a question that seemed kind of easy to answer, if you know your way around the solar system, is in fact very, very ambiguous and open to interpretation or misinterpretation. And that's something that we have to make sure our research questions when we're doing research are not. So it's really important that our questions are answerable and not questions like what's the meaning of life or is there anybody out there or what is love or all, the, all these questions that are really impossible to answer precisely. And as researchers, we're, often, we're guilty of asking questions that are not answerable. Like, is my new intervention any good? Well, yeah, maybe. What do you actually mean by that? Does it work? Again, what what do you mean by that? Uh, is it, as a statistician, I get asked on a regular basis, so is it statistically significant? Yeah, but what does that actually mean? What does it actually tell us about? <laughs> so when we ask answers, uh, I've got a bit of feedback, yeah? <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that too. You should be okay now. Oh, thank you. So when we're asking, when we're thinking about how to phrase our questions, our research questions in a way that they can be answered with a meaningful answer, we should we should use a framework that's called PICO. PICO is an acronym that stands for P-I-C-N-O, and P in PICO is the population or the type of patients or the problem that we're researching. So, for example, if we're interested in uh, the treatment of adults with moderate depression, that's a, that's a relatively specific description of the type of patient or population that we're interested in. And the I stands for intervention or exposure. Well, that's not an I, but close enough, I guess. Uh, so what's the intervention that we're trialing? So we're interested in adding cognitive therapy. 
adding it to what? To the current standard, to usual care, which is our comparator or our control. And then we also need to specify what we actually want to observe the outcome. So we want to see an effect of this intervention in comparison to something else, but an effect on what? So in this case, is, is this addition of cognitive therapy associated with a lower HADS or EQ5D score? So those are specific measures of quality of life or uh, anxiety and depression. So this is, this is a question, this is an example of a question that is specified in a way that a research study, for example, a randomized trial can actually answer, unlike questions such as, is it significant or is it any good? Or does it work? And that that's the that's the Pico framework. It is really simple, but it is really powerful. And when we think about our research questions, there there are a few other considerations. One is what do you actually want to show? Do you want to show superiority? For example, do you want to show that your new treatment, your new intervention, your new drug, your new therapy is better than something else? That would be a superiority question. Or do you want to show that it's as good as something else? For example, if you find something that's potentially much, much cheaper or much easier to administrate, but you want to show that it's as effective as the current standard, then you wouldn't be looking for superiority. You already know it's cheaper, so it is superior in one way, but you want to make sure it's as good as the current standard in terms of uh, uh, the clinical outcome, for example. So that would be an equivalence question. Or related to that, a non-inferiority question where you would ask, is it at least not worse than the current standard? So very happy to see if it's better or not, but uh, at least make sure it's not worse than the current standard. So these are just a few considerations that uh, are important depending on the type of question you're asking. Another thing that often gets uh, mixed up in grant applications, even in trial protocols, is the difference between efficacy and effectiveness, and sometimes eff uh, efficiency also ends up in that mix. And there is some confusion around these concepts. So let's take a closer look at these words. What does efficacy actually mean? If you want to show that something is efficacious, you're asking, can it work? So in the example, this is just an example of a drug trial, but it can be anything really. It doesn't have to be a, a drug trial. In an ideal, you want to know, is there, is there any chance that it works in the real world? So first of all, you have to show that it works in a highly controlled research setting. For example, is it better than placebo? Is it better than nothing? And you would have fairly restrictive inclusion criteria in terms of which uh, patient uh, populations, for example, could take part. So you, you wouldn't narrow it down to those who are most likely to benefit from uh, your intervention. Whereas an effectiveness question is something quite different. It's asking, does it actually work in the real world, for example, in everyday practice? So not can it work? Does it have an effect in a in a, a, a lab setting, for example? But does it work in the real world? And all sorts of factors come into play here. Again, my example of a drug trial, what about adherence or compliance? Do people actually take the drug? So if it works well in theory, if it works in mice or if it works in people who are highly motivated uh, to take part, that's one thing. But you also have to know, does it work in the real world? If if you just uh, if you use a real world setting such as prescription by a GP, and uh, you would then compare it not to placebo because that's not placebo is not a thing in the real world. You would more likely want to compare compare it to something like the current usual care the standard of care, and you would have much broader inclusion criteria for such a study. And efficiency is asking the question, is it worth the effort? So that's where you might need uh, advice from a health economist, because at the end of the day, if, if you want to show that something works, 
the next step is to implement it in uh, in actual practice to roll it out across the NHS, for example. And in order to be able to do that, you don't just have to show that it works as intended, but also that it has a benefit, that it is uh, efficient, it makes efficient use of uh, NHS resources, for example. And then when you specify the outcome, uh, there are many more considerations. I'm not going to talk in detail about all of them. I'm very happy to share my slides so you don't have to take screenshots right now. I don't know if anyone's doing that. Uh, very happy to share the slides and uh, the, the recording will also be on YouTube later and we'll share the link with you. So the most important consideration is what's your primary outcome? And so, so what, what would you want to change? What matters most to patients? to uh, service users, that, that's a key decision when designing uh, a study of any kind, really. And when thinking about outcomes, it's always helpful to consider what has been done in the areas, so looking at systematic reviews, looking at core outcome sets, which exist for many uh, disease areas, for example. So it is, it is pretty obvious that uh, design follows the question. This is not a chicken and egg uh, question. You have to nail down your research question before you can start about thinking the design. The design of your study should not inform the research question. It's always the other way around. So what, I, what I've talked about so far is well, mainly applies to quantitative studies with quantitative outcomes. But what if you're doing a qualitative study? What if you're interested in a in a in a more uh, qualitative research question? Again, it is very tempting, or I suppose it is easier to ask a question that's difficult to answer than it is to ask a, a question that is uh, easy and more straightforward. Uh, to answer, to find a more precise answer to. So qualitative research is by its very nature more inductive and exploratory than quantitative research such as uh, RCTs. And it is nonetheless important that you frame your research question in a way that is helpful, uh, understandable, others and helpful for yourself when it comes to actually answering it. So you may not have a clear a priori hypothesis as you would have in many quantitative studies where you say, I want to test the hypothesis that new treatment is better than current treatment. But you will have an aim and you will have objectives. And it is really, really helpful to focus on a single phenomenon of concept or idea. I'll, I'll show in the next slide what I mean by that. And to state a goal using a verb such as I want to identify or I want to explore or to understand that single phenomenon or concept or idea. So it is very much about being very clear about and specific about the topic of interest, defining the setting as well. So again, coming back to PICO, there is also a PICO for qualitative uh, research questions. It looks, so the P looks quite similar to the P in the quantitative PICO. It's again about the population of interest or the uh, patient group of interest or just describing the problem. In this example, we have caregivers of cancer patients. That's a relatively specific uh, population. You can always be more specific and say uh, female caregivers of uh, bladder cancer patients living at home. So it, it, it may be helpful to be more specific, but it is it is about uh, really what what you're interested in. Now, the I is no longer an intervention because you don't have an intervention in this setting, but it's about what you're interested in. So this is your this is your topic or this is your um, your aim. So you want to find out more about their experiences in providing home-based care. Again, that that is uh, 
that is your interest and then also specify the context. So the co in, in Pico is in this example, rural Wales. Again, you could be more specific if you wanted to, but it, you, you have to be clear about the context in which you're researching uh, whatever you're researching. So this is, the, this is a, a really helpful framework for um, Pico in qualitative questions. Okay, just to just to wrap this up, we've seen that asking questions is really tricky, especially in research. And uh, so this is my penultimate slide, and I'm going to end it with a quote from a famous philosopher who said, as we know, there are known uh, known knowns, which are the things that we know we know. But then we also know that there are known unknowns, which are the things we know. And we know there are some things we don't know. But then there are also the unknown unknown, unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know we don't know, and it's the latter category that tends to be difficult ones. The famous philosopher was, of course, uh, Donald Rumsfeld. So in research, we have so many unknown unknowns that we're facing that we should be very clear at the beginning about the known unknowns, which is related to the research question. So we'll make our own lives much easier if we focus on the known unknowns and uh, don't create any additional uh, confusion or uh, hurdles uh, about those known unknowns. So I'll, I'll stop saying uh, known and unknown now. Just my final slide. Oh yeah, that guys say no again. Uh, so three top tips. Know what you want to know. Be clear about your research question. Be precise. You want a precise answer, so ask a precise question. And Pico is a really great tool when doing that. Thanks very much. Any questions? I think I stopped sharing my screen. Can people still see my screen? Nope, that's good. <laughs>